Good evening, everybody. Today is Tuesday, September 2nd, 2014, and this is a Moscow City Council meeting. And uh, we will start the meeting off with Dan. Would you take us off here and lead us? Gladly. If everybody please rise and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. The move that we accept. I second that. Okay, it was moved by John Weber and seconded by uh, Tom Lamar that we approve the consent agenda. I will start with the roll from Art. Aye. 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 Okay, the consent agenda is done. Six to zero. Okay. <clears throat> Item number two, staff recognition report. Gary Reedner, you have a... We have no report tonight, sir. None. Okay. So, oh, we're moving along pretty quick here, <laughs> folks. Okay, mayor's appointments. I do have um, a consideration for the council uh, that you all receive. Patrick Fekety, who is oh, for the tree commission uh, term. So I would entertain. I'll make a motion to approve that. Okay. Seconded. Okay, moved by Wayne and seconded by Art. Uh, we'll start to roll with John. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Patrick, are you here? Patrick is not here. Well, thank you, Patrick, for serving us, and we'll see you in the future on the Tree Commission. Okay. Public comment is number four. Uh, for mayor's response time, anybody can get up and speak about anything as long as it is not on tonight's agenda. Going before Board of Adjustments or Planning and Zoning, uh, you can please step forward. State your name and address, sir. Say, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Paul Kimmel, 1037 Four Mile Road, Viola, uh, a suburb of Moscow. Welcome, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm here on behalf of the Palouse Basin Water Summit uh, for 2014. And uh, with me is our co-founder, John Kimberling, and we're going to hand out some books from our keynote this year. Charles Fishman wrote a book called The Big Thirst. Um, Charles will join us on October 16th. And this year we're in Moscow for our summit. Um, we cordially invite all of you as elected officials and leaders in Moscow to join us on that day as well as some of the other functions going on. Um, Charles, is, uh, his book is fabulous. I encourage you to read it before the summit. I think um, Councilman Bedke has already gotten a copy. Hopefully you've started that. Um, but he is, he's intrigued by the, the basin, the collaboration that we demonstrate here, as well as uh, the continuing conversation uh, about the, the situation of our water here. Um, I think uh, we have a lot to be proud of, but much more to do as a basin with respect to water. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your support for our summit. Um, this is our 10th year. So we're, uh, we're excited to have him here as well as um, some of our other speakers. We're going to have Moscow High School and some of their uh, problem solvers that have dealt with some of the water issues here. We've got um, Michael Bogart coming back from Boise who worked on interior with uh, the Snake River Basin adjudication, uh, as well as former IDWR director um, Dave Tuthill. So lots of good presentations, and again, uh, we talk about our water situation. So thank you, Mayor, Council members. Appreciate the Paul, support. Paul, uh, you said earlier this was uh, October 16th. Yes. It's going to be the summit. Uh, starts at 4 o'clock at the University of Invest. 4.30. Correct? Yeah. 4.30. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So we all need to make note of that. Um, no, that was exactly what I wanted to have reiterated. Oh. Okay. I just wanted to make sure of the date again. I knew it that day, but I wanted it to get out there again so we could get it in our notes and the viewing audience could hear it as well as those folks with us tonight. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mayor. And just one other thing. You have incredible staff with Nicole Baker. Um, she has really set the bar high with respect to water conservation and just raising that awareness and, and helping us with this uh, event as well as just really kind of raising the level of this underappreciated and undervalued resource. So thank you. Well, Paul, thank you and John Kimberling for your 10 years of dedication <coughs> and leadership on this because this has been a big thing for our community and our region. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
<coughs> okay, others uh, would like to come and address us at the podium? Hearing none, we will move on then. Uh, Citizens Commission Report, Tree Commission, Tom Linden. How are you, Tom? Mayor Lambert, I am awesome. Thank you, City Council members. Uh, at this time, the Moscow Tree Commission would like to make their annual report. And here representing the Tree Commission tonight is our august chairman, Mr. David Rock. <clears throat> august. Good evening. I'm David Rock, and I live at 630 East C Street in Moscow, and I'm the chair of the Moscow Tree Commission. And let me get it started on the PowerPoint here. While you're, while you're doing that and getting it ready, i got to mention something about you, Dave Webb. One of the things at Arbor Day that we had, this fellow was dressed up like a bush in front of a bunch <laughs> of kindergartners, first graders, second graders, and third graders at West Park School, and it was a fun day. Tom, you were out there, as was Nils. I see him in the crowd as well. And that was a... That was a good day, and it was a fun thing. We planted a tree, so I'll let you take off from there. Wasn't that fun? I, and for the record, it was I was dressed as a western red cedar. A red, okay, <laughs> yeah. You are, well, I had that. The difference between that and the fur. So you just, well, thank you for straight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, that was a good time. All right, so move forward here. Um, like to start off with first the mission statement and remind everyone about that. And as you can see, it's, uh, our mission is to plan, establish, help conduct a comprehensive community forestry program for the city. And we do that by ensuring a safe, by ensuring safe, healthy trees. And the community forestry program will enhance the quality of life for all that live, work, and visit the city. So, and I'd like to just touch on the community forest, uh, a lot of us like to look at it as a, a green infrastructure. So a lot of people may not make that connection, but I found this definition of infrastructure, the physical components of interrelated systems providing commodities and services essential to enable, sustain, or enhance societal living conditions. So interrelated systems, uh, trees in the right of way in the parks, they are interrelated with the transportation system, uh, a fabric, as you can see from above, uh, throughout, throughout the community, both on private and public lands. And they provide services. And real quickly, we won't go through all those, but those are just a few of the services broken down into categories of uh, communal, social, environmental, economic uh, benefits. So they provide services and they enhance the living conditions of the city. So it truly is uh, an infrastructure system and we like to call it the green infrastructure. So one way to look at the, our uh, urban forest, which you can view from the sky as, as very distinct. The commission, three uh, purposes, we, we like to educate educate the community, citizens, staff, anyone, about the benefits and values of trees, uh, how to plant, how to maintain those uh, uh, resources. Nurturing, we like to come up with ideas. Some are original and promote those, bring them forward relating to the uh, enhancement of the forest. And we also advise when council or staff have some questions or need some <coughs> input, feedback, we're always ready to, to provide that uh, uh, input. Our team members are wonderful folks, very dedicated, excellent folks, Margaret, Mary Jo, Niels, Ian, Don, and now most recently Patrick, who you uh, approved. And he was at our commission meeting uh, this afternoon and, and he was very excited to uh, learn about uh, the commission a little bit more and uh, he'll be very happy to hear the news tonight. And so that vacancy which should say now Patrick. And of course our council liaison Dan, thank you again, great resource and Tom uh, uh, can't say enough about his, his help with, with guiding us and giving us some direction. 
Tree City USA is a, cre a, a credential that is given by the Arbor Day Foundation, a national uh, organization, and there's four criteria to meet this credential every year, and we have done it so for 21 years. This was uh, last year, I believe, we met the 20-year uh, in a row, consecutive time, but uh, $2 per capita goes per citizen, or $2 per capita goes towards uh, tree care in the city, and that includes parks, right-of-ways, and such. Uh, we celebrate a city ceremony, Arbor Day. We have a tree ordinance, and we have a tree commission. Those four are the criteria that enable us to <coughs> maintain this uh, credential. We're very proud of that. And Mayor Lambert mentioned uh, the fun time we had at Arbor Day. Uh, uh, Principal um, Marino was so gracious in allowing us to borrow his uh, second, third graders for this event. Uh, we planted a tree in Gormley Park next door, and it was a fun Fun time. It didn't uh, rain or sleet or snow f for once. That was good. And uh, uh, the kids were great. I had some concerns about trying to keep uh, about 80, 90, 100, whatever they were of these uh, second, third graders uh, focused for uh, about 20 minutes, but they were wonderful. And uh, so after the ceremony and such, a few weeks uh, to a, see, a month later, uh, the principal continued that tree planting uh, exercise. And in the front of his school, he was so involved and so f he's got great foresight. He planted, had planted six trees, shade trees, to replace those two pines that are going to decline, uh, are in the state of decline, and it will be removed somewhat in the near future. But he's a very thoughtful, th thinking ahead type of person. We appreciate his help with the Arbor Day. And thanks for everyone who came out and uh, enjoyed that day with us. As always, we're trying to promote the education facet of our uh, commission. And uh, four times this summer, one more time to go in a couple weeks, we'll uh, put up our booth, uh, trying to disseminate all kinds of good information. And we had themes this year of uh, planting the right tree in the right place, uh, trying to deal with drought stress and warming climate and how trees will react to that and, and how to select proper trees for that type of environment. And then coming up, we also will have uh, some more information about uh, selection of those species to help in that endeavor. <clears throat> but well received, we get a lot of folks gathering around our booth, grabbing literature and asking all kinds of questions. So. Excellent uh, uh, pursuit. New program implemented, designed, implemented this year. Niels Peterson was the uh, creator of this and uh, ha made it happen. Adopt a tree. We have uh, volunteers, individuals, or organizations, families. They can select a tree in the public right of way that is not on adjacent to private property. Usually it's just perhaps in parks or along other uh, streets that small trees planted, they need some help in getting started. That's the crucial time in those first two or three years. These volunteers are trained, easy session or two, show them how to water, mulch, light pruning, um, and taking care of these and they adopt them, and it's like same same principle as adopt the highway, uh, that type of thing. And we so far we have eight eight volunteers, eight citizens that uh, are on the books and taking care of some of our city uh, street trees. Um, it's great. It helps r r relieve a bit of time commitment for Tom Grundon's crew. It also brings the community into the involvement of helping with the urban forest great program, and I can just see this continuing to grow and grow. We also revised our goals and objectives. Uh, it had been a few years since we had done that. We changed the categories to mirror those presented by the Arbor Day Foundation. Our old categories somewhat fell into these uh, general categories, but 
a little they're a little wordy and these are just straightforward and uh, we have oh with each category we may have up to 10 15 objectives listed that we're now trying to divvy up and see which ones we're most interested in uh, pursuing <coughs> and two of those would be fruit tree pruning workshop that's coming up uh, we hope to have something scheduled for this February and we'll have a, an expert from WSU come over who runs the Tukey Orchards and she'll help provide uh, a workshop for anyone who'd like to know about tree f fruit tree pruning so if you have questions keep an eye out for that and then also uh, tree planting requirements for new subdivisions that's in pro progress as well that little project working with uh, Bill Belknap's uh, department with new to subdivisions we basically have about a little under 50 percent of the tree planting spaces available unplanted after five years ten years one two years whatever how old that ever old that subdivision is so under utilization of the current program monies are available to the property owner they're just not following through and they are there's uh, no reason if they don't want to to do so so we're trying to rewrite the code a bit to try to get some of these tr uh, trees planted in these spaces with those available monies so work in progress for that you'll you'll see more of that coming up <coughs> and then finally just wanted to thank the mayor and the council for all your support in the past and the future we hope and much dedicated city staff that follows behind and helps uh, with a, a lot of our efforts um, can't do this without you all so appreciate that and that's it Dave you're a very modest guy I got to share with you on that Arbor Day uh, that we had out at West uh, Park School the kids there was like 70 to 80 third year old third graders uh, out there and when Dave was doing his presentation those kids were paying attention to what he was saying and when you can get that many kids at that age that are watching <coughs> and Dave made it interesting and fun for him you've really accomplished something <laughs> and so you did a terrific job on that I just wanted to point that out and the uh, fruit tree pruning that's going to happen this winter I got to share with you when I was in high school where I grew up in eastern Oregon my brother and I did that uh, during the winter months to earn money we pruned trees and apple orchards and uh, prune orchards uh, for wow. uh, we did that for three or four years so it was one of those jobs that kids were able to do back then so Excellent. We we uh, we might call Deb in WSU and say, never mind. We have someone here. Well, it's been a while. When out. I start trimming, <laughs> Dave, I start whacking away. So <laughs> I, I think I get the right yeah. stuff, but I might get the wrong stuff too. So. <laughs> and thanks for the Arbor Day comment. It was a team effort. Was a you, you saw everyone there that put all that together. And I thought about coming tonight dressed as my Western Red Cedar, <laughs> but. Uh, I thought that might be over that the top. Surprised <laughs> me that he had the attention of all those kids. I mean, when was the last time they saw a talking bush? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I look yeah. forward to I 2015 I Arbor Day. I needed something, and I thought this this might help out. Couple so. of right. Tom, Corn. Tom, Art, Art, Art. Well, Art. Art. Well, Art. Well, Art. I'm sorry, Walter. Who? I mean, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking right I at Walter. Walter. I said yeah. Tom, Walter. So I meant then I'll go to Tom. A question or on Art. your comment about the new subdivision <laughs> tree planting. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and you may or may not know this may be a staff question mm -hmm. when are the homeowners advised of the fact that we have money available for planting those trees and is there any any organized plan follow-up or reminder system currently in place I think Tom would could answer that yeah I, I could take a stab but let's hear Tom Uh, currently, when homes are completed and certificate of occupancies are issued, typically the homeowner receives a packet from the city, which oftentimes is done each summer, uh, covering previous homeowners moving in from the past six to eight months. Uh, the summer intern will do that, Walter. Uh, on other occasions, I do that frequently, and uh, other people reach out to us because they're aware of the program, uh, that type of thing. 
So that packet is just regarding the tree program? That's correct. And it's a door hanger packet with two or three, four different items in there. Okay. And is there a follow-up to that once you've done it? And if you happen to notice that the house at 709 Cherry Street hadn't done anything in six months, did you go, does somebody go uh, back and do it again? Or? We try to, but it's a struggle staffing-wise, time-wise. Okay. Right. Thank you. Art. You're welcome. For you, David, um, yes. you sort of alluded to it a little bit relative to the elementary school, but as our street trees age out and the urban forest that was planted 100 years ago starts approaching the end of its life, is the commission given any consideration to interplanting or replacing those trees maybe with a little bit of lead time so we don't look like a clear cut at some point? Right. Real, real good question. A lot of the trees in certain neighborhoods are, if you're a forester, you'd understand they're even age stand of trees, if you want to use that terminology. But right, they're uh, about the same age, and they'll all to kind of decline. So one of our uh, objectives in, in a goal is to f continue the Adopt-a-Tree uh, program, extend it into uh, Plant-a-Tree. So the idea is to get neighborhoods... Uh, identify a certain neighborhood, define it as maybe a three or four block area, find an individual or two within that area that advocate of tree planting, get them involved with talking to the neighbors, finding those vacant spaces, providing some funds that can help with purchasing a cost share of these trees, plant them, have the neighbors maintain and adopt their own tree. So it's an extension of that. We are thinking about that, and uh, um, it's just a little bit more, more development on that program to pursue it, but uh, it's something we should consider soon. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Right. And you're on that commission. You're the liaison. Uh, well, yeah, like I say, that as David said, he's pretty much hit all the high points, and it's nice that they, they're, you know, they talk about the, you know, talking about climate change is a little bit, you know, it's it can be controversial, but they they're moving forward with, you know, even if even if the however this what somebody thinks about it, trees are still a good thing to have as far as you know they're going to help you conserve electricity in the summer and winter, you know, as far as shading your house or protecting it from the wind, you know, these, there's just common sense things as far as how trees can help people and and you know it's it's good that these guys are are thinking are forward thinking like they are and. And moving this this forward to, to help people out as far as educate them and use the trees. John, you had a point. Uh, <clears throat> my only comment is I really like the uh, idea of uh, teaching and showing people how to prune their fruit trees. Uh, we've got a lot of them here in town that are in serious need of it, and if I'm not mistaken, if they're pruned properly you get bigger, better, more healthy fruit. And I've uh, been tr trying to think there's a pear tree that I've noticed lately that <laughs> really needs some help. And uh, naturally, I can't think of where it is right now, but uh, I think that's a great way to approach the situation is uh, mm -hmm. you can turn something that is not really very productive into something that's quite productive with uh, some snipping. And, and the workshop will focus both on training young fruit trees, because that's where it really starts and you can do uh, a lot in the beginning, as well as trying to reestablish a nice branching pattern on these old, gnarly, forgotten fruit trees as well. So, um, yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Well, thank you, Dave. All right. And Tom, yeah. for your reports. Very good. All right. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. We will move on to item six, which is a public hearing to open the budget for fiscal year September 30th, 2014. Don Palmer, you have the podium, sir. Thank you, Mayor, City Council members. According to state statute, um, Title 50 1002, the Idaho Code, um, anytime we have a uh, uh, additional funds and appropriation levels that are necessary. We can amend the budget, the existing 2013-2014 fiscal year. And on one occasion, we need to do that, and that's for the 
uh, support of the Moscow School District community play fields. Um, this is uh, funds that comes from the corpus of the Hamilton Fund. It was a decision that was made last April, and in support of that, we need to increase the budget by $369,517. Um, this will overlap into next year. We don't know the time frame of it, but to be conservative is to appropriate the whole um, allotment for the 2013-2014 fiscal year, and then we have already budgeted funds for 2015 for any overage that might occur into the, because of uh, this, the construction season. So this budget hearing is just for that purpose and only that purpose. Normally when I amend the budget, I have array of items, but uh, this year we do not have that as projects uh, seem to finish up in the prior two years. So we don't have that overlap that we have this year. So that's the crux of it. And questions, any questions? Don, before we open the uh, public hearing, Tom. So is this just a matter of um, wanting to make sure we can pay expenses this month, uh, which is in the FY14 year, versus next month, which is in the FY15? Year? That is, is that correct. Basically, the that's the crux of the whole okay. thing. Thanks, John. And this is the amount. Uh, that the city added to the uh, project to make sure that we were able to get it completed? That is correct. Okay. Thank you, Don. We will officially open the public hearing now, and I will be more than happy to have any comments from the public if they'd like to come forward. Seeing none come forward, I will close the public hearing and turn over to council. Tom? I just uh, would like to make a motion that we um, approve the ordinance under suspension of the rules requiring three complete and separate readings and that it be read by title and published by summary. Second. Okay. Tom uh, made the motion to approve. Um, the ordinance under the suspension of the rules requiring three complete and separate readings and to be read and titled and published <coughs> by summary and seconded by John Weber. I'll take the roll starting with Art. Aye. 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 Okay, so be it. Mr. Mayor, before you read the ordinance, um, one comment uh, for anybody that hadn't been by the play fields at Joseph and Mountain View in the last few days, mean. go by. We have green fuzz growing on the soccer fields. Yes, that's where it's really good out there. Yep. It does not need to be shaved yet. It looks kind of nice. The sprinkler <laughs> system's working good out there. Okay, Stephanie, what ordinance number is this? 2014-14. Oh, okay. 2000, okay, this is ordinance number 2014-14. An ordinance of the City of Moscow, Idaho, a municipal corporation of the State of Idaho, amending ordinance 2013-13, uh, the appropriations ordinance for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2013, and ending September 30th, 2014, to appropriate monies in the sum of $57,383,293, and providing for this ordinance to be in full force and effect from and after its passage, approval, and public according to publication according to law. <coughs> So there you have it, and we will move on to item number seven. 2014-14 amends 2013-13. Yeah, Things have to be good. Yep. Some. Comment and question, if I may, while we're on the subject of the ball fields. Um, I think they look great. I go have to go by there just about every day, and so I've seen the progress. And I, I had a question, and, when, and I had it well answered, and that was I see that they're watering outside of the – recommended hours for irrigation which is absolutely necessary because of what we're trying to do there and less uh, okay that for them to be able to go ahead and, and apply large amounts of water at any given time that's necessary my question now who's paying for all that water the city of Moscow yep okay there you go Anything else, Wayne? Nope. Okay, that's it. we'll carry on and move on to item number seven, Ridgeview Estate Second Edition Final Plan. Mike Ray, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. 
Before you tonight, we have the final plat for Riggio Estate's second edition. Confused about this Riggio Estate. Just to reacquaint yourselves, uh, this was the property that was in question. It was uh, approximately 12 acres on the east end of town. You got State Highway 8 there on the south end. We've got Wild Rose Drive to the west, as well as Ridgeview Drive to the west, uh, Notting Hill Drive to the north, uh, within Southgate 3rd Edition. So just to give you a little bit of background as to what's happened up to this point, on May 14th of this year, uh, Planning and Zoning Commission conducted a public hearing, and that was at the request of Thompson Development. And that was for a rezone and preliminary plat for this property. And the preliminary plat was for Ridgeview Estate's second edition. The commission put forth a recommendation of, of approval of the rezone with no conditions, and they recommended approval of the preliminary subdivision plat to City Council with 15 conditions. So then both of those items came before City Council uh, during a duly noticed public hearing, and that happened on June 2nd of this year. So Council ended up approving uh, both items, the rezone with no condition and the preliminary plat with the same 15 conditions that were recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commissions. And those conditions are contained uh, within your packet, within the attached relevant criteria and standards uh, tonight. Then on July 10th of 2014, the applicant submitted the final subdivision plat uh, to be reviewed by Planning and Zoning and City Council. Staff has conducted an internal review of the final plat uh, to determine conformance with the conditions of approval, uh, those 15 conditions that were approved by City Council on the 2nd. Staff has determined that the plat is in conformance with those conditions of approval, uh, although some conditions will be addressed at construction drawing stage uh, of the review process, which is, happens internally uh, within our departments. Planning and Zoning Commission subsequently reviewed uh, this final plat on August 13th and recommended approval to City Council. And so uh, this is the final plat. As you can see, the extension of Ridgeview Drive there to the west. We also have Wild Rose Drive, uh, the extension from the west as well. Um, the eastern stub of Wild Rose here to the east to continue on to adjacent properties. Also have uh, the continuation of Notting Hill to the T intersection with Ridgeview Drive. One of those conditions of approval was the, the street name change at the 90 degree. And so that's what the applicants have shown on the plans. Uh, Ridgeview Drive currently changes here at this point and essentially becomes Roxbury Drive was the name chosen by the, the applicant. And then just to point out a few more features, we've got the linear stormwater swale uh, that was approved for stormwater conveyance. And you also have the uh, park property here at the end of the Cypress Court cul-de-sac, uh, which connects to a trail uh, impervious surface that would lead all the way to uh, the intersection of State Highway 8 and Roxbury <coughs> Drive. So with that, uh, staff's recommendation before you tonight is approval of Ridgeview Estate's second edition final plat uh, with the condition that the applicant enter into the standard development agreement uh, for the installation and timing of the public improvements. And with that, I'd certainly be able to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Mike? From the council? Tom. So, so I didn't see the word parkland on the that little piece when I was looking in the packet, but you're saying you're confirming here that that piece is still the parkland? Correct. The little, yeah, it's that little is tracked. The little piece down there. Okay. I, I couldn't see it on my. It's really fine print. Is it? <laughs> okay. Hey, well, cheaters are I'll look again. <laughs> I don't even know if the cheaters are late. Okay. Well, I'm good. I, you just confirmed it, so I don't need to. I don't. It doesn't say it. Just it doesn't, your, your just Honor, it says area. lot Bill. 7, 13, no. 997. Bill. Just clarify, those are typically not labeled as parkland on the plat. It is through the dedication that the tract is dedicated for parkland purposes. On okay, the thanks. But that's the intention, is that piece right there. Okay, thanks. Bill. Walter? Um, following up on Tom's question, um, so lot, my memory is fuzzy on this, but lot 7 is the Parkland piece? Yep. It would be the piece at the end of the Cypress Court's cul-de-sac. It yeah, should be labeled as tracked. Um, lot 7. It says lot 7. Lot 7. Lot seven. Okay. So, and so, small piece. so what is the 30-foot yeah. area that's called out there in the bottom left corner, southwest corner? 30 feet by 80 feet. That's so a utility. That bottom line right there. there. Thank you. 
Mike, yeah. I'm, I'm going to help you out, Mike. I'm watching Bill and Les to see which one of them looks up. Bill, and, Bill, Bill, and Bill looked up. If I may, that's Thank a utility you. easement. That's what? A utility easement. A utility to serve, easement. I believe it's to serve, um, I guess it's lot eight there at the end of the cul-de-sac down to where sanitary is along the highway. Okay. Oh, because, yeah. And, it, and on the plat, it doesn't need to be labeled as such just to... By by the legend, that dashed line is indicated as a utility easement. Okay. Thank you. Tom? One other question. I, have there been any uh, recommended changes in the um, the zone? Uh, there was a we saw a zoning map in the previous in the preliminary plat. I think. Yeah, that's been approved. Still the yep, same. Yep, okay, so yep. there's been no. That was approved with the with the preliminary plat. Okay, thanks. Right. So so no change there. All right, I'm done. Thanks. Okay. Bill. Okay. John. All right. <clears throat> Make a motion that we approve the Ridgeview Estate Second Edition Final Plat. I'll second that. Okay. With the then one condition. You had one condition, staff. Mike. Uh, does it include that up there, John? Yes. The applicant <clears throat> enter into a standard subdivision development agreement for the installation and timing of public improvements. Absolutely. Your motion carries that. Okay. Yep. Okay, John made that motion, and uh, Tom seconded. Any discussion before I move on? We'll start with you, Art. Hi. 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 Okay, then it is moved forward. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Okay, item number eight, request uh, from Moscow Affordable Housing Trust for match funds. Gary Reeder and Bill Belknap will present. Walter? Mr. Mayor, um, I'm currently under contract as a consultant uh, to the organization making this request, so I'm going to recuse myself. So recused? I am on the uh, board of directors, although I do not hold any office on other than just a member. So I also am going to uh, recuse myself. Okay. You are recused, John, as well. <coughs> we'll give you time to leave the room. Gary, you have the podium, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, what you have before you tonight is a request from the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, Carl Johnson here is the president of that board, and Nils Peterson is the executive director of that organization, uh, requesting $20,000 of funds that were have been uh, in our mun municipal budget beginning in FY 2012, uh, were not expended at that time, uh, carried over to FY 2013, and lastly in the current budget, FY 2014. <clears throat> These funds were originally placed in the budget in 2012 uh, at the recommendation of then Mayor Nancy Cheney. Uh, the purpose of the um, funds was to match a private donation for the purposes that were espoused by the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust. As you know, the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust is um, applying for status as a community housing development organization to assist in developing uh, affordable housing within the city of Moscow. One of the objectives of our Fair and Affordable Housing Commission some years ago uh, was determined that the best way to pursue this was to put it in the hands of the community, and the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust has done just that. <clears throat> so uh, those funds have been in the budget, as I've indicated, for three successive fiscal years. Uh, this year, um, and certainly uh, Carl or Nils can address the council directly on this issue, but uh, we were approached by... Um, MAHT to uh, access those funds. Uh, when I was approached, uh, what I'd indicated was that these funds are available through September 30th of 2014, as that is when our current fiscal year expires unless uh, other arrangements are made. In response to that, uh, you have in your packet a letter signed by Nils Peterson um, indicating, uh, and the date is August 6th, indicating that um, the request is made for uh, pre-development costs, for example, legal fees, architectural engineering services, environmental review, city zoning, PUD applications, marketing, et cetera, and two organizational infrastructures, i.e. computer. <clears throat> uh, as um, I believe the council knows that uh, the 
organization has retained services to interface with the uh, Idaho Housing Authority as well as uh, retained Nils Peterson as executive director to help forward the purposes of the Affordable Housing Trust. So what you have before you is the request to access these funds. Uh, it was taken to admin or excuse me, Public Works Finance Committee uh, last week. Uh, at that time, the request was for $20,000. Uh, in meeting with Don Palmer, our finance director, uh, later on in the week, and looking at our audit requirements and how we account for public funds, uh, this is a bit of an extraordinary situation in that uh, very seldom does the city um, dole out public monies without some sort of set plan. In this case, uh, Typically, how the city does this sort of thing is take, for instance, the LEDC. We essentially contract for services with the LEDC. Uh, we expect um, uh, deliverables, we call them, uh, as opposed to returns on investment. We expect services to be provided uh, that will benefit the economy of the city <clears throat> as well as Latah County. So in this case, uh, what you have is a situation where um, we're supporting the organization, but we don't have a specific purpose for these funds other than the general development costs, uh, which have yet to be incurred, my understanding, and secondly, to help, up off, help set up office infrastructure. Before the council tonight, and, and the way that we typically do this is <coughs> we usually give out funds based upon a project. Uh, project might be um, if there is a specific project that MAHT were going to pursue um, certainly they could bring that project before the council or perhaps even the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission um, if it meets the criteria or the purposes that the city intends um, then to, to uh, promote affordable housing then we could set up a process by which those funds could be dispersed either on a reimbursement basis although that presupposes that the organization pays the bill and then applies for reimbursement of that bill a little bit problematic for some organizations especially for twenty thousand dollars they may not have liquid funds in order to incur that debt and then seek reimbursement but there are alternatives for that and that could be that as projects or programs are put forth that uh, we could set up a process by which uh, a prospective billing or a bid could be presented to the city and the city could pre-authorize that through some process and I would recommend if we were to do that that we would set up the criteria and we would have uh, probably the city grants manager administer that program she's used to that sort of thing and, and uh, disperses funds with the approval of Don's office and that might be uh, the best way to do that on in the alternative the council very well could say we intended that that 20000 should be made available in one lump sum, and certainly we can do that as well. Uh, we were reluctant to do that as, as staff without that specific authorization. So our proposal at this time is to request further direction from the council, how you would like us to proceed. Um, as I said, Carl and Nils are here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, one of the things I think that prompted this action at this point uh, when the request came through and of course the letter came through on August 6th with less than nine weeks left in our fiscal year so if those funds aren't dispersed they go away and that's the information that was passed on to the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust those funds at the council's direction can be carried over so if the council has concerns uh, if they would like a process to be pursued we can certainly put one in place authorization from the council to carry those funds over and they would still be available to the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust through FY 2015 which would give them until September 30th 2015 to tap these funds so as I explained to Nils and Carl uh, both Friday and today uh, the intent is to make sure that the city's processes and our city auditor um, is satisfied with our process not to restrict MAHT's access to those funds so certainly with the direction of the council we could develop the process uh, we could uh, with your authorization carry those funds over remove that timeliness issue uh, or if the council desires to distribute those funds certainly that direction can be given as well and we will facilitate that process okay a question for you Gary now 
uh, for the 2015 budget, the council approved ten thousand dollars for yes for an affordable housing. So what you're telling us, uh, the the council here, is that you could take this twenty thousand that is on the 2014 budget, carry it over to 2015, and it would be a total of thirty thousand. Is that correct? There would be a total of thirty thousand. What if nothing was expended in this if fiscal nothing year? Was expended in the next um, four and weeks. And the twenty thousand that the council has approved would be available. Uh, if the council wanted to make that additional ten thousand dollars available, then certainly that direction could be given as well. But I've been given no direction. Staff has been given no direction on the authorized expenditure of that additional ten thousand dollars. Okay, I'm going to, Dan, uh, you're the Vice Chair of Public Works and Finance. Uh, you were sitting in on this. I don't you, remember it coming to Public Works was and Finance. Was it Administrative was Committee? It admin? I, was I it think it was admin, yeah. Was it? And there's your Tom, were you gone that? I was gone that day, though. Who was chairing that? It wasn't me, but right it was Wayne. 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 Okay, Wayne. It was Wayne. <laughs> Wayne. Was Wayne. Was Wayne. I'll get one of those here. Thought if I just didn't say anything, you guys just looked <laughs> right past <laughs> me. We got that. right down to you. <clears throat> well, the admin committee did listen to that, and uh, we th we think very highly of exactly what they're requesting. It was it was a little vague, as has been brought forward from staff, and um, I don't know that um, the admin committee was all that excited about just writing out a check for twenty thousand dollars and saying there you go have have a good time with it and and make things happen and like you like they need to um, but we do approve of the expending of the twenty thousand dollars and uh, the money was always designed for Choto and in this particular case uh, the affordable housing so the money does need to go to them I think we need to just discuss in what manner and how the control factor needs to be implemented. Yeah. I think Gary brings up some fairly good points. And um, personally, I don't think I'm real favorable about just handing out $20,000 without knowing exactly how it's going to be expended. And I, I think that Carl and Nils can understand that too. So uh, I'd like to have entertain some, some discussion from the council members that are left up here that don't have <laughs> yeah. a con conflict of interest uh, as to how we can handle that. I would, I would definitely want to see the $20,000 carried over into next year you know, if it's not used this year. And uh, I think a process could be put together also, as you're suggesting, uh, to disperse the money to them in an expeditious manner when it's needed. Um, when they show a definitive need. Okay, let's go down the line here. I'm going to start with you, Tom. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with using the funds as we originally designated um, in this way. Um, I think that if, we, if we've got concern over just writing a blank check and, and handing it over the next few weeks just to make it happen this fiscal year, um, I, I can understand that concern too, and I'm not sure that we need to do that, especially given that the funds are available um, after <coughs> September 30th. Um, having some experience with nonprofit organizations, I understand also that it's 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 very helpful to have upfront cash available to to be able to do things. So I'd I'd be happy with um, dispersing some of those funds directly um, and soon, so that they can start doing things that they need to do, um, and then uh, come up with a, a process as as Wayne has suggested. Um, to make sure that um, we know how those funds are being used and accounted for and so forth towards this goal. I, you know, we've seen in several surveys, citizen surveys, that um, um, affordable housing is, is, a, is continues to be a main issue with the city of Moscow, and I, I would like to see us be able to advance this. And, and I think this is a great way to be able to do that. Dan? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with Tom to the fact that... Uh, we do need to help keep this moving forward as far as, you know, helping with affordable housing here in town. Um, and the fact that, you know, I know that the worry was that, well, we're coming up at the end of the fiscal year. Are these going to go away? Well, the fact that we're carrying them over, I think, it should should help the, the, um, the trust realize that we're still going to be there in support. Um, I, I think that... Uh, a good plan is something that we we do need to see. Um, you know, how, however nebulous it is now, I, I think that the 
that Carl and Nels and the and the tra the board can can come up with something more um, concrete, so to speak, to to help out to help us as far as uh, <coughs> knowing what we're going to be dealing with, and and maybe let Don rest a little more easy. Art. I'm in agreement that we need to get the funds to the organization, all right, but I also recognize the fact that the city needs to remain in good auspices relative to the auditors. And I think probably at this point, without hearing what anybody else has to say, that the best way to do it is to maintain a rollover on the funds to provide accessibility through the next year, but set up, as Gary proposed, perhaps a, a funding administration through Lisa Anderson, who the grants manager to create a structure by which the money can be transferred across to the Chodo and the affordable housing people at the same time maintaining the accountability and traceability needed for the city's audits. But I suspect that others might have other information to contribute back there. Uh, Gary, um, a couple of questions. There's, there's several ways of doing this, too. You talked about rolling the 20 over and adding it to the 10 for the 30. Council could always give a portion of these funds now. Say they wanted to give eight thousand dollars of it and roll twelve thousand over with another ten, they could do that as well, or something similar to that. Isn't that correct? Certainly. And what we would propose is to immediately meet with Carl and Nils and set out that criteria. As you can see from the letter, um, there are project associated funds, and then there are um, office setup or start off funds for the Chodo. So uh, with the direction of the council that both of those objectives are fine with the council, we will develop some sort of process to get that done. And if the funds are necessary at this time, we will facilitate getting that back to you, get the process set up so that don't have to wait until next year to access the funds. If we can get it done in this fiscal year, we can do that. Any funds, as you indicate, are carried over. The balance can be carried over into FY 2015. We can utilize that same process and help MEHT facilitate their mission. Why don't we hear from Carl? See, Carl, why don't you stand up Looks here? Looks like he's going to say something. He's ready to, uh, and uh, Nils, you can come up as well. <laughs> so... Let me give you just a little, fill in the blanks a little bit here as to where we're at and what we've accomplished so far. As all of you know, we've been working on this um, affordable housing project for quite a long time, and we've made tremendous progress on that. Um, we've used about half of the 20,000 private donation to bring the organization up to capacity. That's what the federal um, standards look at is what is an organization's capacity to be successful. And it's a rigorous examination to make sure that the federal money is well spent as well. And we're tentatively approved as a CHOTO, and that will give us funding in availability for operating assistance, but that funding probably won't be available until the first part of um, 2015. So right now we have enough funding to carry us through on our basic operations until that time, but we do not have fundings to go out and start developing a project because that's going to require all of the things we mentioned, the engineering, the architecture, the consultants, all of these things to examine a project, line it up so that we can go to the fun federal funding organizations and say, here's our project, here's all of our document documentation to show that it can be successful. That's going to cost some money to put that together. So that's the gap we really need to fill right now to make a project happen sooner rather than later because the sustenance of the organization will be partly through development fees that we generate internally to make these projects happen. So we can't live on um, government money indefinitely. We have to start producing something in order to make that happen. I spoke of the capacity of the organization. One of the capacities they look at is not only your documentation and your professional capacity, but they also look at your fiscal capacity. So having cash on the books ready to go for this development is more valuable in that examination than would be a promissory note. So 
whatever we can do to assure that these monies are allocated as the council would like to see them allocated we're certainly willing to cooperate the city's support has been critical in our development so far and we're very thankful for that questions for Carl uh, Wayne Carl do you have any any really time sensitive expenses coming up um, it's dependent on um, developing um, a targeted project and we feel like we need to target a project this fall and start expending those so I think we're going to need that funding between now and the end of the year we're going we're going to be expending it and how much all 20,000 you know it's going to depend on the size of the project we've identified one project that's quite large maybe 25 homes in the site um, that would require the full 20,000 if we identify a smaller site which might be six or eight or smaller then it would be something less it sounds like the problem has to do with just details and sequencing with various fiscal years and just the need to keep the accounting in good order just for everybody's legal sake I suppose Absolutely. so um, would something where we just go ahead say that the funds could be used this year or rolled over in the next year as we get closer to October 1st and then just essentially I don't know this is going to sound over simplistic and Don will probably hate me but sort of a checkbook kind of a set up through the city whereas you guys see the need you come in talk to the grants administrator okay fine you know here's a chunk go Yes, and that certainly could be one way it could be done. Um, you know, as we identify specific needs, if there's a process that doesn't require all of this decision-making process again, and it was timely in that the need for the funds may be um, very prompt, if it can be done in that way, that might work fine. There's so, a question for Gary on that. Yeah. If something came up, Gary, <clears throat> whatever, the second week of October, these guys run into a situation like Carl just described. How quick would it be, would it take us to get the council to get $20,000? If we have a process put together, and we can certainly work with the administrative committee to develop that process um, and with the affordable housing trust once that process is put together then it's a matter of what done a week to get funds out um, we cut checks on Thursday so as long as the process is approved through um, channels you can have those funds in a week or less well the process though through the channels you mean taking it before the administrative committee no, no. Again? talking you about know? putting a process together and then uh, if the grants manager will be handling the disbursement of the funds she would just check to make sure that the request is in line with the procedure and then could authorize the funding okay so you're looking at like one, one week so yeah, that's that would be a good turnaround I would think and if this council approved that step then you guys would have the authority to go ahead and do it and you just say it's, it's very much similar to us administering a contract for a street for instance where um, less will authorize payments based upon the contract the council has approved based upon the amount of work that's been done so very similar process okay Don had a comment he wanted to make uh, our finance director Don Palmer yes I, th I think the biggest thing is just the criteria of whether it's um, because in the past that that those funds were spoken to as a project reimbursable this came up because it had a lot of organizational things in there so the criteria changed and so we just need clarification as Gary had pointed out once that criteria is determined that it's, it's either project oriented or organizationally um, which is new uh, criteria or a mix whichever council directs us to do in that process will come forward that's really what we need to direction on okay is if it's and then once that's nailed down we can just uh, issue the checks weekly as Gary pointed out okay Wayne <clears throat> well I think we're all on the same track um, we definitely want to have a system put in place as expeditious uh, it's definitive 
in what the purpose of the funding is for, but at the same time is not a cumbersome process for Toto to have to go through. And so I think I would go ahead and make a motion, and that would we, is that we would go ahead and direct staff to establish a reimbursement process for Choto and um, I guess it's actually the Affordable Housing Commission. The Moscow Affordable Housing yeah, Trust. Yeah, Moscow Affordable Housing Trust uh, that would expedite funds to them on a needed basis uh, as long as the staff and our grants coordinator is agreed that it uh, is a worthwhile Need. How's that sound? Well, are we talking about twenty thousand dollars? What, what amount well, are we talking up about? Up to twenty thousand, but it'd be piecemealed out, not just sure. all of a sudden. It, it as <coughs> as needed basis. Should we capture the other ten thousand in this as well for next year? I don't think we need to. I yet. think it's up to the council to all do right. that. The ten thousand is for affordable housing assistance. It may be for Moscow Affordable Housing Trust. It may be for some other project we that was not specified in the uh, I think that well I haven't heard go there yet no I haven't heard a second yet either. Uh, uh, why don't I I second this because I want to be able to get into the discussion okay. piece of it and the one, one if I may before you second it <laughs> if <Okay>. I, <laughs> I just perhaps uh, sure suggest to the maker of the motion that um, <clears throat> you mentioned reimbursement are you specifying that only reimbursement that's the part that or pre-authorization whatever process is is brought to the council that's the that's the friendly amendment that I wanted to request that we okay. make yeah, or that's modification because you did say reimbursement and I would like to see that change that word struck yeah, that, that was might, the best word right? that was the only thing I right. wanted to change was that piece so I just one addition to that motion and that is that you authorize carryover of the unexpended funds yep. into FY 2050 yep that's fine thank you okay we better get this <laughs> we better get this motion clear Stephanie have you got a good handle on what was just said and seconded by Tom. Can you read it back to us so we are, because we threw some things in there. So just let me, does it not have to be reimbursement? That's the only thing I need to know. Did that get changed? I get changed to pre-authorized, that wording, and pre-authorized process. That it would, the 20,000 would carry over into the 2015 period as well. Wasn't that in there? Yep. That was in there. So then, directing staff to establish a pre authorized process for the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust on an as needed basis as long as the grants manager agrees and it's a maximum of $20,000, and the, which is also carried over of the unexpended funds to 2015. Yeah, sounds good. You second that, Tom? Yeah, it's. I don't know. Gary it's looks like he, Gary, yeah. Gary's not liking it yet. Nope. He like he wants Why some other language. Well, I'm really close to <laughs> it. really close to liking it. Um, I, I don't like the language that the grants manager agrees. The council will set the process. It'll be administered through the grants manager. Yeah, that sounds right. So uh, to That's paraphrase the motion, yeah. that the council would direct staff to uh, develop a process authorized and by which. Uh, the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust is authorized to access the $20,000 of funding and that that funding be carried over into FY 2015. Yeah, that's that's what I thought I was second. That's what I said. Yeah, that's what I thought he said, and that's what I thought I was second. Okay. So that's good. Now let's get let's let Stephanie take a few breaths so she can reread this thing again to us. Well, so we got I, it. I was going to go back and listen to it later to make sure I got it verbatim what he said. <clears throat> okay, the the change to that was Melissa's part instead of her authorizing her. What did you say, Gary? Uh, Council authorizes the process she's to be administered by the grants okay, coordinator. The grants coordinator. Okay, everybody clear on this? Yep. yep. Okay, we'll start with you, Tom. Aye. 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 Okay, very good. It passes on that four to zero. And uh, and while we're here, do we want to approach anything relative to the $10,000 that we approved for Well, the, the 10000 is still in the process for 2015. The mm -hmm. thing is, as well as this 20000 gets going, if these guys need that money, then they're going to come forward to us and say, this is what we spent the $20,000 on, if I'm getting it right from Carl, and this is why we need another ten. 
And that would be an easy process to do, just like what we did tonight. Okay. Only that would have to go in front of an administrative committee, so that'd take a few more weeks, and then it would go to the next council. So. Work Sound you. good? That work for you guys, Mr. Mayor? Is the process? I just just for clarification, is the process going to come to the administrative committee next It'll week? It'll be brought back to administrative. So we'll look as at soon it. as we can develop it. So we'll look. So maybe next week, maybe two weeks from now. I would say next week might be a little bit aggressive. I just asked Nils if they had immediate needs for the funding. Uh, he indicated they didn't have anything in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so, so a chance it may be it may be three weeks. Well, and the good news about the good news for that is the fact that if it carries over, we made a decision on the 2015 budget, so the carryover goes right into that. Yep. So. Okay, I'll look for it then. Sound good? At that committee. Thank you, fellas. Thanks. Okay. Um, I will call our recused members, Walter Steed and John Weber, back before we move on to the next item. And it will be item number nine, special event, Sidewalk Cafe Extension Trial. Jen Pithner is sure presenting. You have the floor. Miss <laughs> just bent us over. Wait, what? Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, this item this evening is in reference to a co-hosted event that the City of Moscow and the Chamber of Commerce are looking at um, organizing for this coming September 26th. This is an event that we are hosting downtown to welcome our new and returning students uh, to the university and to the community as well, and including our community members to this event uh, to kind of get everybody commingling and and seeing and experiencing what a wonderful town we have. Um, Jen, can I get you to pull the microphone down? There we go. Um, for the event, we're looking at closing Main Street from uh, A Street to 6th Street, and that would include all of Main Street with 3rd Street remaining open for uh, the cross traffic there. Um, what we'll do is have two bands that will join us, one at either end of that street um, for entertainment, and then as an incentive for our businesses to participate in this party as well, um, we're looking at a special <coughs> event, Sidewalk Cafe Extension Trial. As part of that, um, we'll jump right in. Our current restrictions for sidewalk cafes for businesses include the following. You need to maintain a four-foot unobst unobstructed pedestrian access on the sidewalk. The space needs to be delineated by a non-permanent physical barrier. It needs to abut an, an eating or drinking establishment, and it needs to abut the establishment's property lines. Um, I've got a bit of a crude rendering here that shows kind of the idea of what that looks like, where the green box would be the sidewalk cafe um, as we currently allow that in front of an establishment that is um, either serves food or drink. What we'd like to propose is that the uh, most of those restrictions stay in place, um, maintaining that four-foot pedestrian access. Um, the space would be need to be delineated by a non-permanent physical barrier abut an eating or drinking establishment. Uh, but what we'd like to try for this coming event is that those sidewalk cafes could extend to abut one neighboring business's property lines. Uh, thereby giving them a little bit more space to work with and bringing a little bit more festive atmosphere to Main Street as we host this event outdoors um, downtown. Um, so, for instance, the green box in this instance shows if somebody were to take advantage of a program such as this, what their sidewalk cafe would look like. It's still attached to the business, still delineated by those barriers, um, and can go just one neighbor over to encompass that space. Um, Let's see here. So the requirement for a business to do this or an establishment to do this would be to file an amended sidewalk cafe license area diagram. Uh, this, these diagrams are what are submitted with original sidewalk cafe permit uh, applications. Um, and it would include written permission from the neighboring business who is allowing the extension. And then for establishments serving alcohol with a, um, they may need a catering permit depending on their uh, liquor, beer, or wine license, um, and that would be in accordance with state liquor regulations. Uh, we have we originally looked at um, perhaps waiving the fee for that catering permit, and in reviewing it further, since we are providing an opportunity for the businesses to expand, and that catering permit would run about twenty dollars, perhaps not waiving the catering permit fee 
um, but still providing the opportunity to extend that sidewalk cafe area to the businesses. So there's a little bit of a, a balance there between community needs and providing a festive atmosphere for this event. So um, that would be that's that's the whole program, Dan. <laughs> so when they have a sidewalk cafe currently, is there an annual fee that they pay? It is an annual renewal or re-permitting fee that they would apply for with Stephanie. So twenty-five bucks a year, mm -hmm. and this twenty dollars is for is a one-time. The twenty dollars is for would be for a catering permit that is required by the state, I believe. Or So that permit would cover the area that's not covered in their license as part of their licensed area. And that's for only for those with alcohol, Stephanie. Yes. So those yes. who are just serving food, it would not, would not be affected. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Walter? Um, I'm very much in favor of the block party. I've been a proponent of it when I've had an opportunity to weigh in with city staff or others. I thought it was a good idea to bring the college students into downtown Moscow and let them know that we are down here, and, and we have, have businesses that, that are interested in your presence. Um, I do have one question, though, about the proposal. I believe that we have, maybe promoted is too strong a word, but have advertised this as an alcohol-free event. Um, we have not done anything to preclude alcohol. I'm not suggesting that we should, but is expanding the alcohol serving establishments space and therefore the number of persons they can handle and serve a little bit uh, flying in the face of advertising it as a alcohol free event and that question is for whoever wishes yeah, to you want to take that take that yeah, right. I certainly can respond to that <clears throat> and that was a question that came to me later this afternoon um, the idea is to create more cafe type seating put more people out on the street um, it is just as plausible that people will eat outside because that area is expanded. The intent is not to uh, create any uh, additional regulations. The full alcohol regulations that are in place today are the ones that will be in place that evening. Um, if people choose to drink, they will have to drink legally. Uh, the idea is to create more of an ambiance on the street, have more people outside eating, conversing, creating a more welcome space. So um, we have not promoted this as a, certainly alcohol is not central to this event. This event is about having the students come downtown, meet the downtown businesses, hopefully get some uh, specials, show them that downtown Moscow is there for them as well. Um, we have not restricted anyone from doing what they do in their regular business. So um, expanding the sidewalk cafe, surely you might have a few more tables. You certainly can have those tables on the inside. So we don't see it as promoting alcohol any more than we're promoting eating on the street. One thing I'll say about this, this is Dad's weekend here, uh, the 26th. 27th, the uh, University of Idaho has a home football game, and this could be a terrific way of getting a lot of out-of-town dads with their kids downtown to see what our downtown really is all about. And I think frequently, I think there's a lot of uh, dads that are outside of this community don't have a clue what's going on in downtown Moscow. I think it's a terrific way of doing that, and that's one of the reasons that the chamber and Jen's worked very, very closely with Gina from the chamber on this, and this is the date that came up, as well as the university. And uh, so the chamber is very much involved in this as well. So, And Gina was hoping she could be here tonight, our executive director of the Chamber of Commerce, but wasn't able to make it, and she, we've discussed this idea with her, and she's um, very excited about it. Um, looking forward to the potential of it. I think this is a great way to... Um, uh, enable businesses to increase their capacity to um, be part of this. Um, I'm very much in favor of, of, of trying to make this happen and be as accommodating as possible to encourage the festivities. I think it's a great opportunity for all of us. One other point that I'll make to Council is Gina Terusia and myself will be uh, tomorrow afternoon, we'll be going downtown and hitting downtown businesses and talking to them about this so that uh, Everyone downtown is very aware of what's going on and uh
what's going to happen. And uh, so from that standpoint, it'll be interesting. I'll get a real bird's eye view of how everybody thinks about it from downtown's <laughs> point of view. I'll tell you that. Other comments? Or? Wayne? Well, appreciate Walter's comment about uh, not necessarily promoting it as an alcohol event. I don't see it that way by allowing the businesses that already have alcohol and food be able to use the sidewalk cafe type ordinance to do that. If we were promoting it through a beer garden or something to that effect, I might have second thoughts, but we're not, so. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're looking for tonight is direction from the council. Staff is continuing to work with the ordinance and may, prior to the 26th, come back as early maybe as Monday with if uh, an official resolution is necessary or some ordinance amendment, we will bring that forward. And that can be done prior to the 26th as well. So uh, the city uh, attorney and I and the clerk are discussing that process at this point. Dan? Um, and I imagine Jen's about to ask, how we feel about waiving the fee you know honestly if with as many people as are going to do this i could go one way or the other on it but i think that if it, on that night they're going to make that 20 bucks back pretty quick so i don't think that that's going to be a a big issue to to, have, to, to keep the fee in place gary yeah we discussed that and i'm sorry i didn't jump in on this earlier the the proposal waiving the fee as Councilman Steed indicated, this is not a promotion of an alcohol event. Right. Uh, Art Walk, we waived fees for Art Walk because it was part of an overall event. Uh, it was to encourage businesses to take art exhibits in, and it was a community-wide thing. Uh, this is a situation where an existing business will, if they have three, four, five more tables out, They'll have a chance to make that additional money. So uh, we had discussed it as staff. Jen and I discussed it this afternoon, and we were <coughs> not promoting that waiver of that fee at this point. Something else I'll mention here. Uh, early on in my administration, this is something I wanted to see happen downtown. The, the connection with the university in our downtown, which we have not had, in my view, for years, and it's something I've talked about. And... I have a, had a vision of this. How in the world we're going to make it happen, I had no idea. That's why I left it up to the professionals like Jen and Gary and Gina Teresha and others. I just had this idea that I thought that would be terrific to get the spirit of the University of Idaho downtown and get our town going because, to me, it's a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. John. Uh, the only comment uh, other than support is that if we make it possible for a downtown uh, business, I'll pick one, uh, Casa Lopez, if they are able to add three or four tables for this particular event outside and we do not allow them to serve beer or wine out there if someone wants dinner, uh, we are creating a real problem in the sense that three or four tables you can have a beer or a glass of wine, but three or four tables you can't. <laughs> and so you're asking um, servers who hopefully are so busy they don't know which end is up to make that uh, distinction uh, when if we just add this to it, uh, it will be a lot smoother and as far as the extra money for 20 or 25 dollars, I agree that uh, you serve four or five more dinners. You have not only uh, made it up, but you've made it up quite adequately. So, Walter, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd make a motion that we approve the provision to extend the sidewalk cafes to extend the neighboring property uh, business lines with the written permission of that neighboring property owner. Second. Okay, Walter made the motion to approve this uh, ordinance with a second by Tom. Um, we've got it. We're all ready to go. Anybody got questions on before we vote? John, we'll start with you. Aye. 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 Okay, 6 to 0 passes. Thank you very much. Jim. Thank you very much. Terrific job. Okay, that concludes our normal stuff, folks. So we'll go into the normal stuff. reports, and we'll start with Walter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there were 
couple of items that were on the Public Works Finance Committee meeting last Monday that did not move forward to Council. Um, one of those was a right-of-way trimming policy. Uh, Tyler Palmer, Les McDonald brought this forward at the request of the Public Works Finance Committee. Um, it was first reported to us nine months, ten months ago. Uh, we had questions. We asked that they go back, do some research on what other communities are doing. Um, I had seen in the newspaper a letter to the editor uh, effectively complaining that the city was giving free uh, right-of-way trimming to property owners when the ordinance that we have in place calls for them to do it. So they went back, they investigated it, uh, they came back to us, we sent them back again. They came back this past Monday um, with a proposal. We had a, a couple of smaller questions this time and asked them to go back and, and think about those and come back with a, hopefully a final proposal. Mm -hmm. So that will be coming before Public Works Finance next Monday. I'm, I'm not you don't remember any better than I do. Yeah, I yeah. believe it'll be not this Monday, but the following Monday. Okay, but soon. Um, the other thing that came before us that's not on the agenda tonight was a uh, single stream recycling report by Tim Davis. Uh, he has been, uh, uh, his first comment, interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, was that he wanted to thank the council for giving him a full year to work on the uh, cart system before he got into single stream recycling. And a couple of us looked at each other, I think it was Dan and I, and thought it's been a whole year that we've been on the carts. Uh, and it has. They started August the 1st of 2013. Um, but he has done, during that time, not only run that program, but done a f pretty good amount of work on str single stream recycling and had some ideas that he put forward to us. We asked him to uh, please continue to work that and to bring it back as soon as possible. And I'm hopeful that we will see a actual proposal regarding single stream recycling for the city of Moscow before the month of September is out. Um, the final item we had that's not on agenda tonight was a report from uh, engineering uh, and uh, regarding the uh, 2014 public works projects that have been occurring this summer. Uh, they were not as extensive as I had probably thought they were, but that's why we asked for the report to get some idea of what we're doing out there and some of the issues that are involved in, in getting these projects done. Um, I don't have any other items on my calendar that occurred during the past two weeks, so I believe that is my report, sir. Okay. Wayne, I'll go to you, Benji, filled in for the admin. The admin had a fairly light schedule. There is one item that uh, did not come before the council yet. It will, and that was a request for the city to provide uh, IS services uh, support to Smart Transit. And uh, there's a contract that's being has been drawn up at uh, Smart Transit is looking at uh, before it'll be finalized, and then it'll come back to admin, I suspect, or maybe it'll come straight to council, and we'll take a look at that. It's just it's a matter of of uh, information services supporting Smart Transit's computer system as opposed to Smart going out on an, on its own and trying to get its own support. It just makes a lot of sense to have the city do that uh, as long as we get the right contract. Uh, Jen came and gave a talk, uh, a report on the downtown block party, which we've already heard tonight. And then Kathleen Burns gave a, uh, a pretty good report on the art walk and the successes that it's had this year. Bill Beltnap uh, brought forward a few proposed zoning code amendments that I'm not going to go into tonight, but it's just some things that, that they're working on and then planning and zoning will be looking at. And then Dwight Curtis brought a uh, comparison of uh, the ball fields and facilities, the comparison of the usage by the city and the Moscow School District. He had it all broken down in the pie charts. It was it was pretty interesting to see which which fields we use, the city uses a lot of, and which ones the school uses. And uh, you guys, if you wanted to see that, you could take a look at that admin packet, and it would be in that. So that was that was fairly interesting. That was really all we had in admin. And uh, other than that, I had a couple of meetings. Smart Transit met on the 19th, pretty much a routine meeting on that one. And then uh, I went to Lewiston on August 21st. Uh, CETA, Clearwater Economic Development Association, had their operations and finance committee meeting, which was also Fairly routine, and I won't bore you with the ins and outs of that. So that's what I've got. Art. 
Yeah, Paradise Path Task Force didn't meet this last month due to major conflicts with everybody's vacation schedules. <laughs> so an active bunch they are. So they didn't meet at all. Uh, last week the Sustainable Environment Committee met and uh, went over a uh, few issues, including single stream recycling. But their uh, largest issue was the groundwater management plan, and they would like to see that to uh, provide their input to city council on that plan as it comes forward. And I brought that up to the rest of council and the uh, staff, and so they'll get a look at that as it gets to the point where it's digestible and sort of a finished product. Um, other than that, uh, not much else going on. Okay. Oh, yeah, and that's the pie chart that I was talking about. That you were talking yeah. about relative to the use of uh, the shared parks around town. And uh, I don't know. My personal opinion is we need to look at it to uh, better balance uh, who's paying for what at the parts by way of maintenance relative to ownership. But that's just me. Okay. Dan. Yeah, um, the only meeting I had since the last one was today, and I didn't make it to the tree commission, but they made it tonight to tell us all what was going on, so that's all I've got for now. Okay. Tom? Uh, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> the, the two meetings I was at last week included um, both uh, the Moscow Parks and Rec Committee, and they were very happy with our action on the um, uh, cross, the, the cross um, bike cycle, cycle cross cycle that, track. That thing. <laughs> that thing. That thing that I cycle cross. Cycle cross. That thing. I don't do that. I I bike to work. I don't I don't bike to <laughs> play on grass. But that's really a, they were really excited about that that we move forward, and um, they were uh, very happy with uh, various other um, um, aspects of. Um, a, how well the parks were doing in town, um, looking at both the development of um, the ball fields that were mentioned earlier tonight with the little tiny grasses that are starting to grow. That was mentioned there as well. And also um, uh, the, um, the uh, park that's happening over on the other side. Um, what was that one? Otnes, the Otnes Park, William Otnes Park. So they were excited about how much is, is happening there as well. Um, and the other meeting uh, that was also the same day was the Clearwater uh, RCMD meeting. They're getting ready for their annual um, meeting for the organization that will be um, probably taking place um, in the Kamii region. Um, looks like now October 2nd. So that's, um, that's coming up as well. Um, and then um, later this week, uh, I attend the Fair and Affordable Housing Commission meeting. So. Okay. John? Uh, we had a uh, planning and zoning meeting, and uh, the citizen survey questions lively discussion on which ones to bring forward to the city. And then uh, we've got uh, fence standards amendment and street frontage, frontage exception amendment. Uh, both of those will be uh, dealt with in a public hearing on September 10th at the next planning and zoning meeting. And small changes uh, were made to the draft of both of those before the public hearing. And then the Moscow Urban Renewal Agency had a meeting last Wednesday also. And uh, the Jackson Street front frontage improvements the owner, participa the owner participation agreement and resolution uh, was presented by Gary Reedner, and the board did okay that. And um, the status for the executive director search is still ongoing. And uh, other than that, it was mostly just business as usual and reports on things as we moved along. Okay. My only uh, board meeting that I had was the airport board meeting that I was at last Wednesday and covered the usual things and we're moving forward with that. Tom, did you have another Yeah, comment? I just want to add one more thing. I, uh, it, not, a, not, um, not a city meeting, but uh, this afternoon I attended a presentation at the University of Idaho um, put on by Steve Peterson 
um, an economist, um, he, his presentation was Growth Challenges Facing the University of Idaho Past, Present, and Future. And he was looking at um, um, the challenges facing the university in meeting its, its goals to um, increase numbers of students um, and, and opportunities that, um, through which they can make that goal happen. So it was a, it was a good presentation, lots of um, university folks there. Um, they actually uh, videotaped it, so it, it is available, and he's, of course, got a, a slideshow as part of that. So I think that it might be something that people are um, particularly interested in the growth of the university and uh, the subsequent impact on the city of Moscow <laughs> would, would like to see that. So I, I think it's, uh, I would recommend um, taking uh, the, the time to look at that when it's made available. That presentation was made to? It was made to uh, university folks. Uh, it was a, it what? was a, it was the Malcolm M. Renfrew Interdisciplinary Co Colloquium. So it was just a presentation on campus that I went to. Gary, do you have any reports? Just want to remind the council that we have our monthly city UI uh, school district and county meeting tomorrow, 1215 at Bogies. 1215. 1215. Don't okay. want anybody to show up at 1130. Uh, other than that, no, I have no report, sir. Okay. I would entertain. Motion adjourn. Okay. We that. made the motion. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? This meeting is adjourned, folks. It is whatever time it is. That's what you